Thanks all for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'm gonna be talking about types, techniques, and access for PEG tubes. Uh, these are my disclosures that are not relevant to this talk. Um, and I also have some slides with products from different companies that I am not related to in any way. They were just the easiest to find on Google. Uh, these are my objectives over the next few minutes. Quick talk about indications, types of peg tubes, placement techniques, gastric acid access, and care and controversies. So indications, the three main indications are for feeding, decompression, and gastropexy. Uh, for feeding, most commonly it's patients that have had some type of neurologic insult, such as a stroke or traumatic brain injury, or have dysphagia from other reasons, such as ALS or other disorders. Uh, ENT and esophageal malignancies can also be an indication of place of peg tube for feeding access. Um, decompression, it's often for a palliative procedure in patients with uh, malignant bowel obstruction causing gastric outlet obstruction. And occasionally we also use peg peg tubes for gastropexy in the operating room for patients that might have something like gastric volvulus and aren't a great surgical candidate to undergo definitive repair. There's no strong absolute contraindications for PEG tube placement. However, patients with significant ascites may be at risk for leakage and infection, such as SVP. Um, any patient with ongoing infection, especially within the abdomen or severe clotting disorders, uh, you may wanna reverse those and correct those prior to placing a PEG tube to prevent complications. And then patients with prior foregut surgery, such as a gastric bypass, may preclude easy access for percutaneous um, access to the stomach. So some of you may be asking, what do you mean there's other types of PEG tubes? Um, and while many of us may only use one kit, believe it or not, your hospital will likely have more than one kit available for you. So it's good to know what are the options of PEG tubes and where you might use uh, one kit over another. So there's kind of three factors of the tube itself to consider when selecting a PEG. Um, first off is the size of the PEG. Uh, they can vary uh, from 12 French to 24 French. Many of us use kind of a standard 20 French tube, but if you're using a tube for jejunal access or things like that, you might potentially use a different size. You can then, uh, there's different types of internal bumpers. So the most common one, at least in the United States, I believe, is a silicone-based bumper, but there's also foam bumpers um, and balloon bumpers to keep uh, the tube in place. And then the external tube tubing can also vary. You can have kind of a standard uh, straight tubing on the outside versus a right angle tube, and then you can also have a standard length versus a low profile or, or button type tube. Um, so moving on to the different types of techniques. Um, the first is the pull technique, um, and this, uh, you start with getting endoscopic access of the stomach and then percutaneous access of the stomach. Um, you're then gonna place a guide wire through the, a catheter, um, and then the, uh, remove the catheter and place a snare to grab the guide wire and bring it up um, out of the mouth. Um, you're then gonna connect the peg tube to the guide wire, which is sometimes the hardest part of the procedure. Um, and then you're gonna pull the guide wire out through the ab abdominal side until the peg's at the desired location. And you're gonna secure it with a bolster, clamp, and connector. And I, um, and then the next type is a push technique, which is very similar to the pull technique, um, but the tubes vary. So instead of having a self-dilating tube, you're actually gonna have a tube that has a, a dilator that disconnects, and instead of pulling from the abdominal wall side, you're actually gonna push from the mouth side and push the tube over the wire until it's at the desired location. And so that's why it's important to know what type of technique you wanna do, they're kind of equivalent, um, but it's gonna say on the outside of your kit whether or not you have a pull kit versus a push kit. Um, and, and obviously the type of the tube differs and that's the main difference between the kits. So that's usually very easy to see on the outside of the kit. The other thing that's easy to see is um, the uh, size of the tubing, whether it's a 20 or 24 or 16 French tube. Finding some of the other things like uh, the type of bumper it is or you know, is it a right angle versus standard tube is a little bit harder to see on the packaging, so often you're, you're gonna have to talk to your supply manager if you wanna confirm that. The third technique is the introducer technique, also known as the wrestle technique. And so this is instead of pulling the tube from the mouth out the abdominal wall, you're directly accessing the stomach from the abdominal wall. So after you obtain endoscopic access and confirm percutaneous access, you're actually usually gonna place some type of gastropexy to prevent uh, the stomach moving away from the abdominal wall when you self -dil when you dilate there. So after you do a gastropexy, um, you're gonna, again, use an, a needle and a guide wire to access the stomach. You're then gonna 
do some type of dilation to dilate up to whatever desired size, and then place your gastrostomy tube through, um, usually you'll use a PLOA sheath. And then again, you'll secure the tube with an external bolster, a clamp, and connector. And then if you're using this technique, it's good to know that your final dilator and PLOA sheath need to be about four French larger than the tube size, so if you want to use a 20 French tube, you need to place a 24 French um, dilator and peel away sheath. So again, this is important to also verify the kit you have. So the things that can vary is whether you're going to have sequential dilators that you're going to pull on and off your wire that's in the stomach, or if you have an all-in-one dilator and uh, peel away sheath as pictured in kind of the middle picture, that red item. And so that has multiple dilators within one, so you don't have to peel, uh, take it on and off the wire. The other thing you're going to have to uh, decide is whether or not you want to use, do a gastropexy with teeth fasteners or some type of suturing device. And then moving on to how you access the stomach safely, um, there's three types of ways to confirm that there's no uh, organ in between the stomach and the abdominal wall, and I recommend using all three of these when you're placing a peg. So the first is transillumination, which is just seeing uh, the endoscopic light from the stomach side through the abdominal wall, and you can hit the transillum button on your uh, endoscope tower that gives kind of a near-infrared light to kind of help with seeing the light. Um, the next way to confirm is with just finger palpation, taking a single finger and pushing on the abdominal wall, and you want to see kind of the indentation on the stomach side from the, the endoscope view. And the final uh, way is the safe track technique. So you're going to take a hollow bore needle with a syringe of either saline or you can use your lidocaine, and you're going to be aspirating as you push the needle through the abdominal wall into the stomach. And you're going to see bubbling um, in, the, in the syringe when you see the needle in the stomach. And if you see bubbling before you see the needle in the stomach, then you might have another hollow viscous such as the colon in between you um, and the stomach. So which of these techniques should you use? Should you pull, push, or introduce? There really isn't one that's more uh, advantageous over the other, and they're all equivalent in terms of results and complications, so I recommend doing what you know and what you've been taught. Um, but there are some caveats. So there's some data that the introducer technique um, may have a little higher incidence of bleeding, likely because you're placing gastropexy, so there's more access points to the stomach. But there might be a little lower incidence of infection, and that's likely due to the tubes not being dragged through the oropharynx. Um, the gastropexy with the introducer technique may also be beneficial if the tube has early dislodgement and that may prevent the need for you know, endoscopic rescue or doing some type of laparoscopic washout. I will say that you can certainly place gastropexies like T fasteners even if you're using a polar push technique and so that might be a good thing to do for patients that have altered mental status or are at high risk for self-removing their tube. And then finally, while it's exceedingly rare, there are case reports and case series on um, seeding of the PEG tube tract in patients that have um, ENT cancers. And so there is some data to show that it might be beneficial to do an introducer technique in that situation to prevent the tube from touching the cancer uh, when it's being placed. Now there are times when you certainly can't place a PEG tube. Um, I had a recent patient that had uh, needed decompression for uh, lenitis plastica and metastatic gastric cancer and I couldn't insulate his stomach well enough to confirm that there wasn't in anything in between me. So my next step was to call IR and see if they could safely place it. So our radiologists use um, the Russell technique or the introducer technique, but instead of having an endoscopic view, they use fluoroscopy and they place an NG tube and insulate the stomach with air and then confirm with fluoro and contrast that they're in the right place. They also couldn't place that tube in that patient, so then I moved on to a laparoscopic-assisted uh, tube for decompression, for, again, for palliation for that patient. I think that's a great option when you can't safely place it percutaneously. And you can still use your PEG technique if you want to do it lap-assisted, or you can do a formal uh, laparoscopic G-tube at that time. I think care after PEG tubes is really important to kind of prevent those complications, including early dislodgement. So really it's all about avoiding tension on the PEG tube. So you want to keep that external bumper loose. I make it pretty loose because it often swells for the first 48 hours um, after tube placement, and so you don't want it to be too tight and get buried bumper syndrome or have the tube dislodged. Um, I try to avoid putting any dressings underneath the bumper, again, to prevent tension there, and consider fixating the tube with either tape or some type of uh, tube clamp to prevent tension when it's hooked up for tube feeds. Um, I recommend cleaning around the tube daily with just soap and water to prevent infection, and again, in those patients at high risk for tube dislodgement, consider an abdominal binder.
Um, and then there, despite being a very safe and widely practiced techniques, there are still some controversies in the literature. So um, there is data showing that preoperative antibiotics prior to PEG placement does reduce the relative risk of infection and um, by about 65%, and certainly people do get PEG tube infections. That picture on the right is a patient of mine six months into practice that actually got an NSTI um, from a PEG tube. So definitely giving something that's going to cover skin flora, such as a first-generation cephalosporin, is important. Um, the next is whether or not you need to do a second look endoscopy after you've placed the PEG tube, if you need to go back and confirm. There's data showing that it's unlikely to change your tube placement at all, um, but I'd say it, it's well worth the extra minute or so just to make sure there's no bleeding at the site. Finally, timing of tube feeds. Many of us were uh, taught to wait 24 hours before initiation of tube feeds. There's really no data to suggest that that's helpful, and it just prevents patients to getting to gold tube feeds. So you can really start feeding immediately after placement. So in conclusion, know the PEG kit that's available at your institution and verify your kit. Choose a technique that you want to use and stick with it and know the reasons for maybe an alternative technique. Practice all three methods for a safe access to the stomach and kind of use proper post-op care and consider the literature um, for safe care afterwards. Thanks. Okay.